Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here, and I'm really thrilled to welcome you to tonight's talk by Dr. Edwin Krupp called How High the Moon. Tonight's talk is inspired by the Hammer's current exhibition called Drawing Down the Moon. Artists have forever been depicted drawn to depicting the phases of the moon as it's seen from here on Earth. And this exhibition presents moon artworks from many centuries and many cultures. The exhibition was curated by Allegra Pacenti with assistance from Mathieu Vahenyon. And most of the moon-themed works in the show come from collections based here in Los Angeles. As Allegra says in her notes on the exhibition, the city has long been a primary platform for cosmic connections, home to the Griffith and Mount Wilson observatories, as well as to organizations dedicated to more esoteric considerations of the moon and beyond. The moon that emerges from within the confines of the city of Los Angeles is a place of paradoxes. This extraordinary presence in the sky ultimately connects all terrestrial beings to one another, but it's also the bond to the vast celestial realm within the mind of each individual maker who seeks it. So given that context by Allegra Pacenti, it's only appropriate that we have a talk on the celestial component of human belief systems by one of the leaders in the field. Dr. E.C. Krupp is an American astronomer and has been director of the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles since 1974. Krupp studied astronomy as an undergrad at Pomona College where he actually lived inside um, their bracket observatory for two years where he was a caretaker, weatherman, and telescope demonstrator. He went on to receive a Master's of Science and a PhD in Astronomy right here at UCLA, where he studied the morphology of rich cluster galaxies. When Dr. Krupp started at Griffith Observatory, it was just after the Apollo moon landing. In fact, his father was a mechanical engineer who actually worked on NASA's Apollo program and also on the space shuttle. During his 48-year career at the Griffith Observatory, Krupp has had an enormous impact on the city of Los Angeles, on science teaching, and on the study of the history of science. Many of you may not realize, but the observatory is one of the most beloved and most visited landmarks in Los Angeles. And more people have looked through the telescope there than in any other telescope in the world. And in fact, there's a big New York Times article about that today, about the Griffith Observatory. Um, so check it out. They get about 1.6 million visitors each year. That's probably way more than all the museums in Los Angeles combined. And they do that with only around 30 or so employees. But somehow Dr. Krupp has managed to make that work. When he became director of the Griffith Observatory, he foresaw the need for improvements, updates, and maintenance, and formed a nonprofit organization, Friends of the Observatory, to raise over $120 million to support the building and its educational programs. And today, the Griffith Observatory is one of the greatest jewels in the crown of our city. And I'm very grateful to him for his stewardship of this important site. In his non-existent spare time, he spent more than 40 years studying archaeoastronomy, the study of how ancient cultures viewed the sky and how those views affected their cultures. He's now recognized internationally as an expert on ancient, prehistoric, and traditional astronomy and has visited nearly 1,800 ancient and prehistoric sites throughout the world, regularly leading field study tours to exotic locations that have astronomical and archaeological interest. And tonight he's going to share some images from those studies with us. His contributions to archaeoastronomy include five books, innumerable journal and magazine articles, and book chapters, and several children's books, as well as many planetarium shows. Very few academics have the ability to transmit their enthusiasm about science in a way that can engage thousands or millions. Stephen Jay Gould, Jane Goodall, Sylvia Earle are a few names that come to mind. Dr. Edwin Krupp is another. His complete dedication to educating the public in a way that's intellectually rigorous, yet completely engaging, is not just a gift, but it's a skill he's honed because he knows how important it is. It's serious work and critical to the future of our planet. He's the science teacher we all wish we'd had, and I'm very grateful for him for the years of public service he's given the city. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Edwin C. Krupp. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Very generous. Uh, I am most grateful to the Hammer Museum uh, for the opportunity to come here tonight, but I'm far more grateful uh, for the exhibit 
uh, any time you throw astronomy around in a museum somewhere in the world, uh, everything gets better. So, and this one's really got it. I hope you've all had a chance to, uh, to see the exhibit. It is quite a marvel, quite a mix, and uh, does not include this particular record. Uh, this is, uh, in fact, uh, How High the Moon, uh, just another one of those elements of the lunar soundtrack and I hope you appreciated the curation of uh, the music that preceded this evening's program. A lot of work apparently went into that, too. But uh, I remind you, uh, because this, of course, uh, was a tune made famous uh, both technologically and musically uh, by Les Paul and Mary Ford. Uh, for Les Paul and Mary Ford, there was no ambiguity about the moon's whereabouts. The, the song is actually quite explicit. The moon is high uh, and it's far. And despite its astronomical distance, there are more than 100 items drawn down from the moon on exhibit now at the Hammer Museum, and none of them is about the moon. They're all about us. Uh, I have a few favorites. Here are some of my favorites. Uh, this is Caspar David Friedrich's painting, A Walk at Dusk. It not only has the moon, probably Venus, a person, and a prehistoric megalithic monument. You can't go wrong. Uh, then uh, we've got uh, Yoshitoshi's uh, marvel, uh, Ushiwaka and Benkai dueling on the Gojo Bridge. I love Steve Ditko's original Spider-Man comics, but, but this beats them d just over the wall. Uh, and then Carl Friedrich Thiel's, uh, Thiel's set design for the... Uh, scene of the descent of the Queen of the Night, Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, is, is such a wonderfully theatric treatment uh, of the Celestial Vault I, I included in one of my books. I, uh, you know, if planetarium skies were like this, the shows would be easy. Uh, and then uh, one last, uh, the Virgin of the Apocalypse is, as usual, uh, standing on the moon. But go look closely at this moon if you haven't uh, looked at this piece before. Uh, the moon in this case looks particularly oppressed under the feet of the Virgin. So uh, again, it's, it's pretty easy to argue that everything uh, that we say about the moon really is about us, and that shouldn't surprise anyone. Although the moon doesn't qualify for inventory even in, in a universe that contains trillions and, and trillions of galaxies, uh, it is a prominent feature of, of our lives. It's hardly a speck uh, in the universe, but it's a big deal for us. And it's conspicuous and it's distinctive and it appears large in the sky. Uh, and it is bright, of course, in the night, and it shifts its place with respect to the background stars from one day to the next. Uh, it changes its appearance quickly and dramatically, and it is obvious, and, and so we pay attention to it. We likely have been watching it for as long as we've been watching anything. Uh, after the cycle of day and night, uh, the moon's behavior was the most obvious celestial rhythm apparent to our ancestors. There's circumstantial evidence we've been paying attention uh, to, to the moon and, and its phases since the upper Paleolithic, when these notations on a piece of bone uh, were carved approximately 30,000 years ago. Uh, Alexander Marshak interpreted them as uh, daily marks through a two and a quarter month period of the moon's phases. It isn't, he thought, necessarily a calendar, but instead, he imagined, was related to some time-factored narrative, a story long lost to us, but in some way tempered uh, by the passage of the moon's phases. I suspect we were actually attentive to the moon long before someone inscribed this piece of, uh, of eagle bone, uh, but there is no evidence to verify my prejudice. So it, it is no wonder that we, we pay attention to the moon. It's, it's hard to miss. It's on stage, overhead, visible to all, in pursuit of its own agenda, answerable to no one. Uh, like all of the celestial objects, it appears, or at least appeared, to have power, and in fact it does. It lights the sky, it orders time for us, it times the tides, and through the cyclical transformation of its phases, it mirrors what we traditionally regarded as the fundamental pattern of cosmic order and the generational renewal of life. It's really the only story that we know, the only plot line that we ever tell, birth, growth, death, and renewal. So we, we, we figure the moon means something, uh, but not everyone figures the same thing. And so we project ourselves onto the moon like this, and we often forget that the face that we see there is actually our own reflection. And that, that face in the moon in this drawing may in fact be the face of one of those two women engaged here in drawing down the moon, which is lassoed by a rope that reaches the ground. 
This imagery belongs to a, a Greek vase from the second century BC, and the, um, the two women are performing a ritual that was mentioned by the ancient Greeks and, and Romans. It is, in fact, recognized, this, this image, as the only image from antiquity identified as drawing down the moon. So here, one of the women brandishes what is presumably a, a ceremonial sword and, and salutes the moon. The other holds something like a wand and raises her arm, perhaps to reach the moon. And the inscription, which is really not well translated, seems to say something like beautiful and perhaps a phrase that's something like those of the mistress. Uh, details of this uh, moon roping operation have not been transmitted through the millennia, however, and contemporary neo-pagan versions are, are really all modern inventions. There was a drawing down of the moon in antiquity, but uh, we really don't know what it was, except in the classical era, it was classic magic. The, the earliest Greek reference to this procedure is in The Clouds, the comedy by Aristophanes, and there it's attributed to a witch in Thessaly, far to the north of Athens, and other ancient writers documented the magical powers of the Thessalian women. Uh, the idea may be older even than that. A, a Neo-Assyrian text from the 7th century suggests women in, the, in ancient Mesopotamia uh, could also pull down the moon. And according to the Latin poet Ovid, the trained and initiated specialist that performs this miracle, quote, strives with the reluctant moon to bring it down from its course through the skies. And that cannot be easy. The moon is respectably far from us, on average about 240,000 miles, so that's a lot of drawing down that you've got to do. A long way to pull, even with supernatural power. Also, drawing down the moon is not really a good idea. Uh, the moon is about 2,000 miles in diameter, that's about the distance from here to Chicago, and although the moon's mass is 80 times less than the Earth's, if you draw it down, it's going to cause a lot of trouble. So. I caution. Uh, the moon travels completely around the sky with respect to the background stars because, of course, the moon orbits the Earth. This is no news to any of you. At least I hope it's not news to any of you. Uh, this travel is accompanied, of course, by the moon's transformation, uh, its phases, and the, the diagram indicates both. You've got the Earth there, of course, with a, a moon going around, and the sun is somewhere out of the picture off to the right, shining on the uh, the two objects, and then its appearance to us on Earth varies according to its position, and this, uh, this very um, uh, thoughtful uh, little painting uh, compares uh, the position and the orbit to the individual phases of the moon, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep coming back to that in any case. The cycle, say from one full moon to the next, takes 29 and a half days, and that interval of time, of course, prompted us to count a unit of time once called a month, a term that is rooted in the word moon. Uh, the word moon derives from the Indo-European word for measure, and so by name and by use, the moon was affiliated with the measurement of time. That's fundamental to it. Our months, however, no longer really match the, the moon's phases, and this is August from a couple of years ago, but it doesn't matter. And if you take a look at where the phases of the moon are marked, uh, down there, full moon on the 26th, the new moon up there on the 11th, and I mean, nothing, nothing matches the, the beginning and the end of the month. They're, they're all out of whack, uh, and that kind of thing happened a long time ago once we separated uh, these, these two habits, one look looking at the moon and to uh, somehow uh, making our calendars work for us. So our months no longer uh, match those phases. We've now assembled a, a set of months that begin and end really without regard for what the moon is actually doing. Nonetheless, this pattern is so familiar, so regular, and its length is so convenient that uh, we even pay our bills uh, in an interval that equals the, the period of uh, this time uh, of the moon's metamorphosis. So once, of course, uh, in past, the, the months really were moons. Uh, the Egyptians counted the days of uh, the, the moon uh, growing uh, up a stairway on uh, this relief in the temple of, of Hathor Dendera. So each of those days is a god, and each step is a day on the moon's march from uh, new moon up to the, the full moon, which is lodged at the uh, upper end of the stair. Uh, that's just a detail 
uh, photograph of the actual relief high on the ceiling at, at that temple and picking out the moon's disk in the last few stairs there. Uh, the um, 14 days of the moon in decline are represented in a disk in the relief next to it, uh, which is illustrated in the drawing there. And those, that disk with the eye is the moon, and the seven gods above, seven gods below are those uh, 14 days of the declining moon. And there again, a, a detail from, from that ceiling. Just uh, again to emphasize that the people really did at one time count the months out by the days of the moon. So in the old days, uh, then, each of the moon's packages, uh, those are old days, you can tell, because they're, that's not Griffith Observatory, they're up on a ziggurat there. Uh, and uh, the moon's packages of periodic time would begin with some very easy to spot event in this cycle, say the appearance of the first crescent, which is more or less what's illustrated then in, in this uh, romantic picture. Uh, that first crescent shows up low in the west in the early evening, uh, right after the, the brief roughly three-day period, the intermission when the moon is visible. And this, in fact, is uh, a shot some years ago of a waxing crescent moon, the moon uh, reappearing. A couple of planets in the sky there as well, Jupiter and, and Venus. Uh, but the, the critical value of, of this particular image is, is what happens in a day. A day's change is unmistakable. If you look at the moon again at the same time on the next night after the first crescent, the crescent will have grown a, a little bit and will be hanging higher above the western horizon than it did the night before. And you can tell that as well because Jupiter and, and Venus are still in the picture there, but they're, they're much lower down in the right-hand corner. So I, I know it's no mystery to you how we, we get those phases of the moon, but it, but it never hurts to reflect on the mechanism. Uh, half of the moon is always reflecting sunlight because some half of the moon is always facing the sun. And from the Earth, though, we, we, we don't always see the entire sunlit side of the moon. Just how much we do see of it depends on the placement, of course, of the moon, the sun, and the Earth, and, and hence another diagram like we saw before of the moon positioned at various places around its orbit and the corresponding phase that we get uh, because of that position. So opposite the, the sun, the moon, of course, is fully lit, and we see it rise as a complete disk as the sun sets. And when the moon is in the same direction uh, as the sun, we, we see no moon at all. That half that faces us is the dark half. And both of those, of course, illustrated in, in the image here. Full moon over here, we face it, and we see the sunlit side over here. Uh, the sun's still over that way, so it's the dark side at that point that's facing us. Again, no mystery to anybody be here. So by the time the first crescent signs on, uh, the moon has shifted to the east of the sun, and a small fraction of the sunlit moon faces us. And then by first quarter moon, because we, we've moved along here from new moon to that crescent, now we get to first quarter moon, and we're a quarter of the way around, and we get a, a, a right angle there between the sun or, and the earth and, uh, and the moon. And, uh, and we get, of course, then uh, what looks like uh, a half moon in the sky. It looks like a half moon, and that's why we call it a quarter moon. makes a lot of sense. Uh, a few days after the first quarter moon, the moon looks bigger uh, and brighter. It, it's now oval in shape, about three-quarters full. This is called a gibbous moon, and gibbous just means humped. It has two humps in the two curves of its sides. Gibbous lemons, you know, uh, they get sliced and squeezed into lemonade. Gibbous footballs are, are transferred back and forth, sometimes in gibbous stadiums. And gibbous hips market designer jeans. So the adjective may be unfamiliar, but the shape we know well. Uh, the gibbous moon is said to be a, a waxing gibbous moon in this case. That's not to be confused with paraffin. A waxing moon is not made of wax, it's a growing moon, and the verb can be trained to the Old English for wixen and to the German for wachsen, both mean to grow or to increase in extent, and that's actually what the moon's doing. But uh, the moon keeps moving, of course, and uh, we get to the, the diagram again, and we are now past the, the gibbous moon over here, and we get halfway around uh, to, the, to the full moon when the, from when the moon was in the same direction as the sun, visible now, it's opposite the sun, and the entire uh, sunlit face looks our way, and we see a completely illuminated disk or full moon. And because it is opposite the, uh, uh, the sun, we see it on the other side of the sky from the sun. It can only rise when the sun sets, and it can only set when the sun rises. Uh, then the moon begins to shrink. 
Uh, it has been waxing up to a point through these phases, and then it starts diminishing again, going down to the other half of the month. Half of the month is gone, and we now see a waning moon. Uh, this moon derives from the old English word wanian, which means to lessen. And when something wanes, it declines in power, strength, or influence. Uh, and, and we hear, hear the same ideas echoed in the old English adjective wan. It just means dark or gloomy. Uh, and we still use that word to mean pallid and pale and diminished in health and spirit or power. So by the time we get past the period of full moon, our, our vocabulary is really explicit. Uh, the moon is in decline. And the waning moon then just goes through a reverse sequence of phases from uh, a waning gibbous moon to the last quarter, uh, to a waning crescent moon, which is visible in the early morning, and then finally back to invisibility when the moon is once again in the same direction as the sun uh, from uh, the Earth, and, uh, and we don't see the sun at all. And so uh, we see the moon then just dress in more light from the start of the sequence each night after the, the new moon's brief period of invisibility. Uh, and then after, until the disk is full, and then uh, the moon disrobes as it symmetrically sheds its light and, and shrinks again until uh, there's no moon at all. Well, these costume changes are repetitive and systematic, but they are an illusion. Uh, the moon, of course, is a sphere and doesn't really change shape. It just appears to do that. The, the moon's phases occur because the moon is, well, this is really simplified, but nicely so. The moon is round uh, like a ball. It reflects sunlight like a mirror. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it emits no light of its own. Uh, but uh, we see the phases because the moon orbits the Earth. So those are the three rules in place. And thanks then to reflection and geometry and gravity, we've got all of these phases of the moon. And we've also got some odd phases of the moon. There's the very famous one Wilshire moon. You don't get to see that very often, but it shows up now and then. Uh, patterned cyclic change makes the moon uh, the world's transformer and the master uh, of time. It is, in its way, uh, an, an independent wanderer. Uh, it cuts its own course uh, against the, uh, the current of the sky's uh, daily turn. The daily shift in location is considerable. Uh, its daily change in appearance is dramatic. The moon really does mean business, and it's easy to follow if you just go out and pay attention to it. Most of us don't anymore, but it's not that hard to do it again. Uh, what, we, what we call it, uh, moon, uh, is a word uh, that we've already uh, heard is rooted in an in Indo-European syllable found in the word for measure. Early on then, people were impressed by the moon's part in measuring time, and they linked its name uh, to measurement. So to our ancient and, and our prehistoric ancestors then, the, the moon was, was really a rhythmic mystery that bundled the days uh, in cycles of growth and, and decay, birth and, and decline. It was ever on the move in appearance, uh, in its place, and in the time when it is seen. Uh, each month it grew from darkness into that brilliant disk uh, that stayed up all night, and then rising later each night it declined and died and disappeared until it was reborn again from the dark of the moon when time midwifed uh, one more month of birth, growth, death and rebirth. The moon was then uh, really uh, an uncanny but reliable light in the sky. And because it changes so openly and, and, and so theatrically, it symbolized change and was credited with the power of change. It was associated with all kinds of change and it was thought to be divine. Uh, and there, in fact, is that point is made uh, in the exhibit uh, drawing down the moon right here. Uh, and a couple of examples of that, and we'll move into a few more, in fact, of uh, the moon as a god. In ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece, the moon was deified and personified. Uh, Sin, the Mesopotamian moon god, was a regulator of time and an agent of, of cyclical renewal. Uh, the Egyptians personified the moon as Khonshu and showed him with a, a crescent crown. In fact, one hieroglyphic text really does it all. Moon in the night, ruler of the stars, who distinguishes seasons, months, and years. He comes ever living, rising, and setting. Egypt's god Osiris, uh, the revitalizer of life, uh, ruled the transformation from life to death and, and judged the dead on their way to a new life. And he was also uh, equated with the moon. 
uh, text on the ceiling of the main hall in the temple of Hathor at Dendera, which I, I showed you earlier. Uh, uh, and that temple probably belongs to about the first century AD and the time of the, the Roman emperor Tiberius. In any case, those texts say very explicitly, Osiris is the moon. So there's no doubt about that. Uh, the ancient Hindu moon god is Chandra. Uh, this is a piece from the exhibit here uh, at the Hammer right now. Uh, and his name means luminous. Uh, this item, as I said, is on exhibit. And Chandra schedules rituals, provides a haven for migrating souls, rules over the growth of plants, controls the tides, and influences and stores the rain. All aspects of, of elements of change. And each of these and, and many more moon deities are male. But many other peoples have made goddesses, of course, out of the moon. As Selene, the, the moon was, was female uh, in Greece. Uh, and the Greeks symbolized her celestial movement with the, the silver chariot she rode across the sky, drawn by, by the horses. And her name is rooted in the, in the word uh, for light. The Romans called the moon itself Luna, and her name persists in the familiar lexicon, of course, of, of moon madness as lunacy and lunatic. Uh, a bronze Roman statue in this exhibit, this one right here, uh, may be Luna. Uh, and then here is a much later uh, 15th century uh, treatment uh, in a portrait of Luna in an Italian manuscript, the Sfera. Although uh, Luna, or, or Selene, personified the moon in the sky, the forever young and virgin huntress and mistress of the wild animals, Artemis, uh, called uh, Diana by the, the Romans, also has clear connections with the moon in classical mythology. This is Renoir's uh, very unclassical, much later uh, painting of Diana, but a delight in any case. Uh, here's Diana again in Vicenza's uh, Palazzo Ciricati uh, with a proper um, uh, crescent uh, accompanying her. And then a modern treatment uh, of Diana from uh, uh, a gallery in, in New York. Diana also presides over the Reforma in Mexico City. Some of you uh, probably uh, know. She's, she's pretty shapely and has as little concern for modesty as the moon itself. In fact, seems to be mooning us right now. Usually undraped, uh, but sometimes uh, some self-appointed guardian of public morality and the exposure of goddesses drapes her like this, at least from the hips down. So there was no moon out that night in Mexico City. Uh, now, there was an earlier moon goddess in Mexico City. Uh, there she is. Her name was Coyle Schalke, and she wore just about as little as Diana does to, uh, today. Uh, we know that because a complete portrait of Coyle Schalke, not just her head as we saw there a moment ago, uh, was discovered by accident uh, under the pavement in downtown Mexico City in 1978. And just as Diana was a moon goddess and not the moon itself, Kyle Schalke may have been a lunar goddess and, and not the actual moon, uh, as evidenced from uh, the, the stories told by the Aztecs about her. The Maya of uh, southern Mexico and Guatemala uh, also had their moon goddesses, and a goddess also inhabited the moon in traditional China. And if you looked carefully and quickly there, you saw both are accompanied by a rabbit because it is easy to imagine a rabbit on the face of the, the moon. And in fact, many peoples around the world have recognized that in the dark markings on the moon. The, the Chinese still acknowledge the moon goddess at the mid-autumn uh, moon festival, uh, which honors her on the 15th day of the eighth month of the lunar calendar. And I'm pleased to say that this was my very first encounter with uh, the moon goddess with a box of moon cakes, which are typically offered commercially at the time of the mid-autumn moon festival. We're sort of in the middle of it right now, or close to it, uh, and is probably the best image uh, of the, the moon goddess I've, I've ever acquired. So uh, the, the trouble with collecting moon cake boxes with good imagery is you're stuck with a lot of moon cakes after uh, you bought them, but that's just um, that's the price we pay. Um, she's also remembered by the missions that China's space agency has sent to the moon. They're, they're named uh, for the moon goddess. So birth, death, sacrifice, rebirth, immortality, women, fertility, water, the growth of vegetation, and fate. All of these themes meet in the moon because the moon, more than anything else, symbolizes the principle of transformation and cyclic change that, that seems to propel nature and to guide its, its course. Now, for the, the Greeks and Romans, however, uh, the moon was not only a, a goddess. It was also a place, but it's not a place that, that we know. It was a supernatural realm, a kingdom of souls, uh, a gateway to the beyond. 
By the time we get to Aristotle in the fourth century BC, uh, the moon had actually also then become a component of a cosmic system, and this is a much later rendition of the Aristotelian universe, but as you look out from the center with the little green uh, foliage uh, standing for the earth there, the, the moon is out in one of those spheres uh, and detectable by that crescent shape uh, in the one, two, three, fourth uh, rung out. Um, the, the nature of the moon was unclear uh, in the classical era and time of Aristotle, but it was regarded as something physical, part of the hierarchy of, of the heavens. And in the second century AD, Lucian of Samosata figured you could go there, and he fictionally transported sailors to the moon by whirlwind. He gave the moon a, a kind of terrestrial geography by treating it as an island in the sky inhabited by people. It wasn't exactly a world, uh, but it was a physical place, a, a, a locale. Other, other dream voyages to the moon were imagined in antiquity and, and through the centuries. The, the moon was both a physical and a supernatural realm. In 1516, Ludovico Ariasto in Orlando Furioso uh, sent Astolfo, an English knight, uh, to the moon with St. John, the evangelist, on a chariot that transported the same chariot that transported the Old Testament prophet Elijah uh, to heaven. So that is one way of getting to the moon. Astolfo there uh, met St. John on a mountaintop, the site of paradise, and they took off uh, to an Earth-like moon uh, to retrieve the lost wits of the hero Orlando. Galileo, however, uh, really called in the chips of natural philosophy in 1609. You see him there at Griffith Observatory on the Astronomer's Monument, accompanied by the moon, uh, when he observed the moon through a telescope and described its features, spotting mountains and basins and craters and plains and what he thought were seas, Galileo realized that the moon is an environment. It became a world out of reach, but beckoning. And of course, there are copies of Galileo's key work with these illustrations showing uh, in the Hammer exhibit right here, so you can see them in person. Uh, Jules Verne turned uh, the moon into a target in the 19th century and shot his pioneering science fiction astronauts by cannon into space uh, in from Earth to the moon. The moon then became a, a genuine destination, at least in fiction, and a variety of other mechanisms for space travel were enlisted by other visionaries uh, from and through that era. Baron Munchausen just sailed the ship uh, to the moon. Uh, in Edgar Allan Poe's The Adventures of Hans Fall, the, the trip was made by balloon. And then, of course, in 1950, George Pell transported everyone to the moon in movie theaters and drive-ins uh, by rocket. And then finally, on, uh, well, there they go. And on uh, then July 20th, 1969, men from Earth actually achieved the real thing. The moon was no longer just a world. It really did become a landscape. Well, it's easy to understand why it, it took so long to reach the moon and to know what it's really like. Um, I already mentioned that the moon is, is really, really, really far away, about 240,000, that's about a quarter million miles from Earth. Uh, but it's hard for most of us to, to grasp physically a distance like that. I, however, actually have a better sense of that distance than the average person, uh, and not because I'm an astronomer, uh, but because I drive a 1968 Camaro, uh, and I've had it from the beginning. Uh, it's got over 520,000 miles on it, so it has, in fact, been to the moon and back. <laughs> not, notwithstanding my, my lunar excursion, uh, the Apollo astronauts really did draw, you know, when it, you know what it takes in terms of rebuilt engines and spark plugs and oil changes to get to the moon in a Camaro? I mean, this is, this is more than Apollo, let me tell you. Well, in any case, uh, the Apollo astronauts r really did draw down the moon. 53 years ago, last month, men from Earth first landed on the moon and brought some of it back home. And going to the moon is one of the most extraordinary things the Earth has done. Soon after the planet formed, it nurtured life and eventually sent that life packing for adventure beyond the customary borders. Then in 1969, for the first time in four and a half billion years, creatures from Earth deliberately left the planet and traveled to another world. That is not easy. The planet deserves credit for pulling this off with organisms that took billions of years to evolve to be game enough to do it. That said, uh, the moon started to lose some of its glamour as the Apollo astronauts got close to it. In 1968, when the Apollo 8 mission performed the, the first circumnavigation 
uh, of the moon over Christmas. This is before the first landing, of course. The astronauts said the moon is, quote, essentially gray, no color, looks like plaster of Paris or sort of a grayish beach sand. Astronaut Frank Borman called it, quote, a vast, lonely, forbidding type of existence or expanse of nothing. Later on, on the surface of the moon, Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin called it magnificent desolation. For all practical purposes, it seemed to some that the moon had been secularized by space travel. Uh, Life magazine, a national weekly almost everyone knew, wondered whether our, our, our long-standing romance with the moon could withstand space-age disenchantment. Instead, a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. In conjunction with the rest of the Apollo program and the entire inventory of the planet's exploration of space, that first moon landing changed everything. We do see and understand the universe, the Earth, and ourselves differently now, but it still hasn't all sunk in yet. We also haven't yet fully appreciated what the Apollo astronauts alone encountered. They directly engaged the cosmos like no one else has. They acquired a singular perspective delivered only by the moon, and they experienced an epiphany no one expected. The astronauts were struck by something besides Apollo 8's gray, colorless, vast, lonely, forbidding, and empty moon, and Buzz Aldrin's magnificent desolation. But it didn't really command headlines. According to James Lovell, though, the vast loneliness is awe-inspiring, and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. Lovell wasn't just restating a common sentiment about home. He could see the Earth, and he said, the Earth from here is a grand oasis in the big vastness of space. Earth, in fact, and not the moon, was Apollo's great discovery in 1968. And the astronauts were the first to see, with their own eyes, the whole Earth, a small but fetching blue marble in space. And they took pictures, and they sent them back, and they altered our perspective dramatically. You can track the emergence of the modern environmental movement back to our first pictures of the whole Earth in space. Earth was obviously the most attractive planet around. William Anders captured that experience on the fourth time his Apollo 8 spacecraft pulled around the far side of the moon. An astonishing aquamarine Earth rose out of a bleak and, and battered lunar surface. The photograph was so iconic, it wound up on a postage stamp. National Geographic turned it into a three-page fold-up. Men from Earth did not get that kind of view again until May 1969, when Apollo 10 took crew to the moon to practice the operation of the lunar module without actually touching down onto the moon's surface. And on that mission, astronaut Eugene Cernan looked at Earth and sensed he was, as he said, wrapped in infinity, a concept that also eluded him for the lack of familiar references, boundary conditions. As he looked in every direction toward familiar stars, he said he saw, quote, even more stars stretching beyond my imagination, Stars in eternal distant blackness everywhere, there is no end. A kind of an interesting thing to hear from an astronaut. And in its way, that's just what the first picture transmitted from the James Webb Space Telescope has just done. But the scope and scale of this vista are even un unimaginably greater and much more, again, for us to try to absorb and sink in. Well, Cernan, back at the moon, explained he was not an overly religious person but he confirmed he was profoundly affected by seeing what he called the endlessness of space and time with his own eyes. When the spacecraft made its first passage around the moon, Cernan said it was breathtaking to watch our planet climb from below the lunar horizon, its sharp colors seeming to warm the bleakness of space. It was, he said, overpoweringly, overpoweringly beautiful. Two months later, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were on the surface of the moon. This isn't it. This is the Willow Springs petroglyph site in Arizona, and somebody thoughtfully commemorated the moon landing uh, there. Well, there, Aldrin's and, and Armstrong's time on the moon was short. They, they were preoccupied with assigned tasks and new wonders. Nonetheless, Aldrin, in his 1989 book, Men from Earth, preserved the memory of looking high above the dome of the lunar module at the Earth hanging in the black sky as a disk cut in half by the day-night terminator. Mostly blue, it was ornamented with swirling white cloud. He could also make out continental land, and he was struck by the difference between the two worlds, the Earth and the Moon, one dynamic and the other a static relic. In 2009, 
Aldrin published another memoir, Magnificent Desolation, and by then the impact of his experience on the moon had crystallized into meaning. He recalled opportunities for reflection on the flight back to Earth and remarked, it was an interesting feeling looking back at Earth. Our blue and brown habitat of humanity appeared like a jewel of life in the midst of surrounding blackness. In the book, he expresses his regret that the astronauts were neither directed uh, to nor, nor capable of capturing the emotions of the experience and sharing them with the world. And they didn't at that time. Uh, so that may be so, but now most of the personal accounts written by these men later convey without artifice the emotional impact of the journey, and they make its meaning accessible to the rest of us after all. Apollo 12 experienced the whole Earth from space, and, and although the crisis on Apollo 13 precluded celestial reverie, uh, the return to Earth was particularly inviting to, to that crew. And then Alan Shepard brought to the moon uh, by Apollo 14, this is in 1971, looked up at the Earth, two-thirds dark, uh, encased in um, uh, a diamond uh, hard blackness, uh, and the uh, remaining crescent, a third of the world hung, as he said, magically in the void, incredibly dimensional, suspended, floating, levitated, breathtaking, gorgeous. It was, he said, home, and where all of his friends were. But from the moon, it was quote, very finite, very fragile, so incredibly fragile. He acknowledged his, his own identity and, and said that he was a test pilot, an astronaut, an explorer, an adventurer, a master of winds and rocket fire, hero to millions, but on the moon, the earth made him weep. For him, that view was the real reason he, they had come to the moon, that one single long look at the fragile and beautiful Earth. It was as though, he said, he was sent there, he and the others, so that they might look back at that lovely sensitive sphere and then carry home the message that everyone must learn to live on this planet. In July 1971, Al Worden flew to the moon and as command module, a uh, pilot uh, remained in orbit while Dave Scott and James Irwin went down to the surface. And there's a picture of Irwin on the surface in the Hammer exhibit here, historic photograph. Even before Worden reached the moon, he noticed the Earth, the brightness and the intensity of the bottomless blue oceans, as he said, and of the clouds, where something photos cannot capture. The horizon, he added, was paper thin. There seemed to be nothing that separated the surface from the deep blackness of space. Earth looked very vulnerable in a way I'd never understood before. Worden effectively describes his extended observation of the moon in his book, Falling to Earth, but despite the entrancing character of the moon, he emphasized that he never grew tired of watching the Earth rise above the moon. And his entire six days in lunar orbit, three of them in solitary confinement, no matter what he was doing, he stopped to watch each and every Earth rise. It, it was, uh, he wrote, the most beautiful thing I had ever seen or imagined. Uh, perhaps, Worden added, you have to go to the moon to feel it. But, but I could see that the Earth was truly finite. Once it's gone, it's gone. The experience was mind-altering. I had journeyed all this way to explore the moon, and yet I felt I was discovering more about our home planet, our Earth. Uh, so the beauty, uh, the beauty and the fragility of the planet had elevated yet another astronaut to a new and, and, and sacred cosmography. And every time Worden went around the moon, behind the moon, his trajectory carried him through a zone where neither light emitted by the sun nor light reflected by the Earth could reach him. It was utterly darker than any other sky he or any person had ever been able to see, except those that went up there in that position. And he saw tens or hundreds more stars than could ever be seen with the unaided eye on Earth. There were so many, he wrote, I could no longer find constellations. My vision was filled with a blaze of starlight. There was more to this universe than I'd ever imagined. Astronomers know this is so, but Apollo astronauts actually saw it. Uh, another element of this new perception of space and time was granted to Worden during a spacewalk on the return to Earth. When he looked in one direction, he's outside the capsules now, and he looks in one direction, hanging there from the spacecraft, uh, he sees the entire moon hanging in space. And he turns his head and sees the entire Earth hanging in space on the other side of him. 
This perspective, this, this new cosmic axis linking the Earth and the moon, is possible only when you're far enough away from both of them. And Worden said, in all of human history, no one had been able to see what I could see just by turning my head. The structure of the sky had begun to change. Apollo 16 ferried uh, men to the moon again in April 1972. It was the same story. Uh, Eugene Cernan returned to the moon with Apollo 17, and on the outbound leg, uh, his crewmate, Harrison Schmidt, was struck by how fragile a piece of blue the Earth seems when seen from a distance. Cernan, like all of the Apollo astronauts, was entranced by the moon, but during the descent of the lunar module, he was permitted only two quick looks out the window. And he already knew he said there was something, quote, rather spectacular out there, and he was intent on seeing it. And for a moment, as he said, the earth dangled like a colorful Christmas ornament in the middle of the window. They got the, to the ground, of course, and then marveled at the Taurus Littrow landscape on the moon. But Cernan wrote, the earth kept drawing my gaze away from the bleak surface, and the reality felt like a hallucination. I'd already seen it many times, but was still mesmerized by the most spectacular sight of the entire journey. Well, memories from Apollo 10 flooded back as I reflected on the rare privilege of standing on the moon and looking back at the only known place in the universe that contained life. So perfect. Later, as he prepared to leave the surface of the moon, he reflected, I knew that I'd changed in the past three days and that I no longer belong solely to the Earth. Forevermore, I would belong to the universe. Again, a remarkable thing from a test pilot, fighter pilot. Many years after uh, Gene Cernan's return from the moon, a conversation with his five-year-old granddaughter prompted an epiphany. He tried to explain he had flown by rocket to the moon and lived three days there. And after a long pause, his granddaughter responded, Poppy, I didn't know you went to heaven. And Cernan said he felt a jolt. Her remark, he said, unlocked the riddle that had puzzled me for so many years. My space voyages, he wrote, were not just about the moon, but something much richer and deeper. The meaning of life weighed not only by the facts from my brain, but also by the feelings from my soul. For a moment, I was again standing on another world, watching our blue earth turn in the sable blackness of space. Too much logic, too much purpose, too beautiful to have happened by accident. My destiny was, not, was to be not only an explorer, but a messenger from outer space, an apostle for the future. Well, we can't really say that each and every Apollo astronaut on each and every mission sensed the same majesty, heartache, and awe, but they all were put into an environment unlike anything anyone else has known. And we're lucky to have these personal accounts uh, of uh, majesty and heartache and awe. They're narratives that, that document the transformative power of space travel, and what we thought were expeditions uh, were really pilgrimages. So it isn't what we learned about the moon. It's more like what it's like to be there. It's about what does it mean, and we have to rely on the astronauts for the answer. Buzz Aldrin, uh, Buzz Aldrin um, wrestled with that over his career, and he confesses it, it took him 40 years to understand it all. He recently wrote, I have come to believe that the real value of Apollo 11 was not the experiments that we set up or the, the world uh, or the, the rocks we brought back. It was in the shared experience in, in which people throughout the world who witnessed our landing participated. Nothing like that had ever happened before. No other single event had galvanized the world's attention to such a degree. People on every continent shared our triumph as human beings. I have not seen any other single event evoke such a response. And he told the Congressional Committee, it's not the value of the rocks that we brought back or the great poetic statements that we all uttered. It's that people witnessed the event. So traveling to the moon altered once and for all our traditional and archaic sense of Earth and sky. Uh, the old cosmic framework uh, with its horizon and its vault, its zenith, its world axis, uh, was anchored by the way the sky looked uh, and seemed to work from the surface of the Earth. It was an abstraction that was rooted in uh, perhaps even millions of years of, uh, of primate observation and perception. And, and when the observations and perception were eventually amplified by, by space travel, a different relationship between Earth and sky began to affect what we do. The moon made that happen. Although uh, the Apollo astronauts' experience of, of the Earth and, and space uh, from the moon in, induced uh, uh, a new sensibility, 
that abstraction is really no more accurate than the mechanism that we'd already embraced for millennia. It's still a very narrow and, and local view. It has, however, altered our behavior, and the Earth perceived from the moon has infiltrated culture. In, in 1997, uh, I wrote about two concepts uh, that uh, had emerged as agents of I ideological uh, uni uh, unification in, in this book. One of them is the environmental sanctity of the Earth, uh, an issue that emerged and preoccupied people. And the other was the cosmic mystery of space, another issue that had a growing preoccupation in our imaginations. Th that wasn't a prediction back in 1997. The process was already underway, and it, it just continues today. Space travel was not the only force at work, but it was a powerful and essential driver. And we're operating now under a new ideology that's leveraged by a new and, and, and different cosmovision. The Apollo astronauts really were inadvertent missionaries, and, and no matter how audiences more than 50 years ago and, and now regard what happened and, and how it looked and, and what it meant, it did change everything. It was a watershed event in all human experience. We really did go into the blue, and the astronauts didn't even have to tell us what they felt at the time. The pictures, the pictures alone irrevocably altered the way the rest of us now operate, even if we're not always conscious of that and the sky then still moves us. So our ancient ancestors pondered the sky. Uh, we, on the other hand, are trying to inhabit it. We now draw down the moon by wrestling out of that well of gravitational potential we climb every time we step into space. And what was once a, a kingdom for gods whose gaze downward uh, governed the Earth, it's now a place uh, we ourselves visit. Uh, a zone where the space shuttles shuffled and, and where satellites circle and, and tell us many of the things we once believed only the gods could know. So we don't just look at outer space, we go there. And we have put ourselves in the sky. We have, in fact, left footprints on the moon. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm told we can entertain a few questions if there are a few questions think of the Artemis program? Well, the, you know, first, um, I have to speak as a truly uninformed person in the sense that uh, I, I'm far from the program as most of us are. Um, so all I have are emotional responses to it, and the emotional responses is go, go get it. Uh, I, um, I have, uh, there, there are limitations and difficulties, but that's what space exploration is all about. And I am sure we are going to face uh, issues with respect to schedules and costs and difficulties and trouble. Um, but if you value the evolution uh, of the human imagination, I think it's another key element of that task. Ah, sorry. The, um, the Artemis program is the, the next effort to go back to the moon. Big rocket has been built uh, essentially on the Apollo uh, scale. Uh, to go to the moon, land there, and also then carry out uh, further activities for ex ultimately extended occupation and then perhaps other enterprises once there. So it is a major space initiative. Uh, paralleled uh, only in a sense uh, by far more modest, but I think no less important um, activities uh, that are taking place much close to home uh, in orbit, and, and that those are expressed in the commercialization of, of space. Uh, we've obviously demonstrated that we need and use space all the time. I mean, the, the phones, for God's sakes, you know, we, we'd all fall down if we didn't have those satellites. But the, the fact is, um, it, it's possible to make a buck in space, and that's going to keep changing uh, things as well. So I... Um, I don't have a, uh, I, I'm, I'm never inclined to project the future that I don't know, but I'm delighted that we just keep pumping it out there. Anything else? I start asking you questions if you don't ask me questions. Okay, how many of you have seen the exhibit? Okay, the rest of you have to go. Um, there is talk that if you can get a certain critical mass of uh, um, whether it's algae or pump out enough oxygen and get some photosynthesis going, that you can actually cultivate uh, Mars and turn it into uh, 
semi-livable or maybe the moon. Uh, uh, are there fables about that, living on other planets? Uh, well, we certainly have modern fables about living uh, on Mars, as you well know. I mean, there are lots of people invested in the attempt to do that. Um, if getting to the moon is really hard, getting to Mars and staying there is even harder. And the, the obstacles uh, ahead of uh, us, if that is an endeavor we pursue, uh, are, are going to be remarkable to see. Um, you can imagine doing the kinds of things that you just described of, of cultivating uh, plant life on, on Mars. Uh, and in that sense, it's, it's really very simple. It's just physics and chemistry. All you need are everything you got here on Earth. Uh, there's not a lot of it yet that we know is all right there on Mars. The atmosphere is a bit of a problem. But uh, since there's no oxygen and uh, uh, there's really no nitrogen, uh, it's mostly carbon dioxide, uh, but uh, not much of that. Um, but that kind of imagining, that kind of dreaming um, is, in fact, the kind of thing that takes us everywhere that we eventually go. And I have no quarrel with people's wild and crazy notions of what we're going to do next because we wind up doing some of them. Any other questions? Looks like a question in the back. I just had a couple of questions. By the way, fantastic talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, why is it called the uh, the quarter moon as opposed to the <laughs> half moon, since it looks like a half moon? That was one question. And um, the other one is, have you talked directly with any of the Apollo uh, astronauts who walked on the moon and had any interesting you know, insights from them directly to you? Yeah, uh, fair enough. First, the, the, the first one is, is perfectly reasonable question and, and should drive everybody nuts, but the answer is really simple. Uh, the quarter refers to it being a quarter of the way through the cycle. Uh, and, but we often think in terms of fractions and the appearance, and, and so you have this very funny business, which I'm sure confuses many kids, where you say it's a quarter moon, but it looks like a half, and so what do you do? But it, it, it's a quarter away around the cycle, and the, the last quarter is, in fact, at the start of the... Uh, the last quarter of the cycle. Um, I, uh, I have spoken to a, a few astronauts over the decades, uh, uh, Buzz, Buzz Aldrin in particular, uh, Harrison Schmidt, and a few of the others, but never in the circumstance that would reveal these kinds of personal details. And so all of this material, I, I only know from them secondhand uh, through the efforts that you know, they committed to, to print. Um, the, just as individuals, um, they were always uh, on the move, as like everybody is doing something, and, and a contemplative, quiet moment like that with any of them never crossed my, my uh, chances to talk with them. Yeah. Microphone, thank you. more question, which is that you said that looking back on our planet is really what created the environmental movement. And I wanted to see, do you think there's any contradiction maybe between having so many rockets, having so many satellites, which of course is not very good for our atmosphere. Do you see anything or maybe about the idea that we can escape to another world, that it turns our eyes away from taking care of the gem that we have here? Uh, first, um, thanks for the question. The environmental movement had roots that preceded all this, but the modern sort of acceleration of it really came with, with that understanding of this earth and space. And, and if you look at popular culture and, and the various publications that are following, um, there were certainly important pieces of work being done about the impact on the environment. Uh, you just go back to Rachel Carson, for example. Uh, but uh, the, the perspective that affects so many people, uh, enough to catch attention so that people are paying attention and, and can even get it into their head, say, this is something we have to think about. I mean, you're, you're trying to mobilize billions of people to, to do something. Uh, that, that is a, a, a significant task. And, th and this image had an incredible role, still has an incredible role in mobilizing 
uh, that momentum. And so I think that the momentum that you see today is very much a part of, of, of these, these moments in, in the history of space travel. Now, the other part of your question is, um, are we, uh, are essentially, are we polluting space? Well, of course we are. Uh, I'm an astronomer, you know? Uh, the more stuff up there, the harder it is to look. And, and that's really true, you know, all the Starlink satellites and all, and th th they, they actually do interfere uh, with, with telescopic observation from the Earth. Um, but there are lots of different priorities that propel human beings, and many of them are, are really important and, and useful. And neither I nor any other single person get to decide, okay, this is the thing. We come to it, we hope, by consensus. It doesn't always work that way. Um, and I simply opt uh, for the optimistic view that over time, the consensus of how to balance this will develop, particularly out of the understanding of a crisis. And we are certainly uh, beginning to understand that we have a crisis to address, and I don't think all of the satellites and all the rocket launches are really the problem there. Uh, that, that, that is a proverbial drop in the bucket compared to how we consume energy. Uh, nearly 8 billion people on the planet need it, and that's every day. I mean, that's, that's part of where this issue is going to be. Um, and those go to issues of population and water supplies and all kinds of stuff. It is, in fact, way above my pay grade. All I can tell you about is that we need to make the skies darker than they are. So if I could turn off the lights in Los Angeles, I would do that. I tried once when Halley's Comet came around and discovered there is no big switch. <laughs> so are we done with questions? Oh. Yes, are there any valuable minerals on the moon that are maybe suitable for mining? I heard something about in the past that they were considering setting up mining operations on the, the moon. The is that a fable, or is that uh, the only thing up there is cheese? <laughs> now, you know, fair question. Um, th any enterprise that is complex, costly, and labor-intensive, you, you begin to wonder, you know, if it's hard to do on the Earth, geez, on the moon, it's really going to be hard. Uh, certainly, there are minerals on the moon that are probably valuable. Uh, the idea that they would be useful up there to bring down to Earth is unlikely. Is it possible to use the moon, and I'm not speaking as, as an expert in any of this realm, I'm just one of the consumers of the, uh, the, the pop prognostications as others are, but is it possible to utilize materials on the moon to construct things that are in orbit around the moon and are stations for going beyond for extending space exploration. And that's certainly likely to be the case. Um, whether it's feasible to do that or not uh, remains to be seen because you need, you need more than, than just, say, a valuable mineral. Uh, at the very least, you need to be able to make energy and water. And so is, is it Possible, might be. But there's there's evidence for some water. Can it be, can it be made available? Is there, you know, the the scaling of all that, not at all clear at this point. Yeah. Hello. Um, what are some of your favorite things about the observatory? <laughs> Now, is that not a sweet question? What are some of my favorite things about the observatory? OK, this is easy. One, it's free. Hey, hammer's free, right? That's good. Free is good. Uh, number two, it's an observatory. That's good, too. It's about astronomy. We, 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 we like that. Um, number three, uh, and this might seem a little odd to you, but when I walk from my car, uh, to the entrance uh, that I take to get to the offices, um, it is easy to hear 10 different languages and very often up to 30. Uh, and, and so it's an entertainment to see if I can recognize them, uh, but it's telling me everybody comes there. Uh, and the demographics, as we've, as we've sorted that out, it, it really does reflect certainly California. Uh, so the... The populist character of the place really does appeal to me, and that is built into its DNA by Colonel Griffith, who left the money 
he was uh, a populist and he had very specific ideas, including that the place must be free. So there's, there's uh, all of that uh, built into it. Um, but I, um, I'm entertained by the fact that I can see the whole Los Angeles basin from it. Uh, it is the best piece of public observatory real estate on the planet. There is no question. And so uh, uh, you, get to, you get to work in a park, you get to work in a, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Hugo, oh, so listen, we're, okay, you want, you're calling out that Hugo Ballin should be one of the best things at the Griffith Observatory, you're absolutely right. Um, Hugo Ballin, you know, was a muralist uh, in the 30s, uh, worked for Hollywood as well, uh, motion pictures, and painted the murals in what is now the Keck Central Rotunda at Griffith Observatory on the historic level. And if you've been there, you would certainly know those murals up above the Foucault pendulum uh, that is a mystery to most parents as they walk in with their kids to try to explain what that thing is. Uh, fortunately, we don't leave that mystery lagging very long. But uh, the Hugo Ballin murals, um, I'm always charmed by because it's very unfashionable art. Uh, the, and th those, those murals have been taken for granted, you know, for the entire history that they've been in Los Angeles, with a few exceptions. Uh, but uh, they are perfect for the space that they are in and the function uh, that they fulfill. And uh, the, the, uh, there's nothing like them anywhere else in the world. And let me carry this just a little bit farther. In the 1950s, when the Chinese in Beijing built their new planetarium. They modeled it after Griffith Observatory, architecturally and uh, programmatically to a great degree. They came to Los Angeles and, and all that and took uh, lots of notes and everything. But when you walk into the, uh, uh, the, the, the main hall there of the historic planetarium in Beijing, you have a Foucault pendulum in the center of a rotunda, and you look up, and there are murals over your head. Instead of the classical mythology of the Greeks and the Romans uh, of the sky overhead, uh, it's Chinese mythology. It's just perfect. So uh, I, I uh, enjoy the fact that uh, Hugo Ballin's uh, legacy carried the notion all the way to China. Anything else? Well, then everybody should get to go home. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to have you see you tonight. And I thank the Hammer very much for doing the exhibit and for letting me get to see it and be with you tonight. Thanks.